at a quarter past six. Mr. Stylianidis has just arrived also from Ankara, where we yesterday had a lot of meetings with ministers in Turkey. And he will be with us shortly. But before he comes, I want to say a few words to our guests and to our friends that are here with us. In 2014, elected the new parliamentarian with my colleague George Grammatikakis, two people from my party. And I started working in the Joint Parliamentary Committee, European Union and uh, Grand National Assembly of Turkey. We started working on the huge area of relations between EU and Turkey. And all these years, you imagine, I talked a lot with politicians, ministers, but also I had the rare chance of visiting again and again or meeting here in Brussels or in Athens with uh, Turkish people, citizens. And what I saw, it was even more interesting that, than the official visits. What I discovered was the richness, the fullness of the Turkish civil society. It was not something that I could not imagine. But as I was looking at the examples, as every meeting we had, we were evaluating what we learned. It was amazing how all of this combined into a picture, into a bigger picture, that from the one hand showed how deep the needs of people are. On the other side, they showed how many people exist that they form organization like the ones that we host today or individuals that try to elevate the problem, to lift the burden from these people. And that was amazing. You know, nowadays in Europe, we have populism on the right rise. We have extreme right wing on the rise. They have something in common. No solutions to problems, accusations, demands, look to the past, but they grow. And they grow because it's easy when you see a problem to condemn somebody. It's less easy to find solutions and to propose that. And we tried to do that in our JPC meetings. We tried to go over the problems and discuss solutions. But in Europe, the situation is difficult. And we also see that when they think about Turkey. Extreme right wing say we don't want Muslims in Europe, they don't fit here. This is an insult firsthand to their own citizens. Many of them are Muslims. But also it's an insult to neighboring countries, to Turkey, to Albania, that they have Muslim populations. But that, what we have seen is that because of this strong rhetoric, because of the problem of refugees that Europe could not handle as we could, as we should, based on solidarity, not leaving some countries to get all the burden. Because of all these issues, nowadays Turkey has a, a, creates a strong feeling into some parts of the populations, maybe also in the European, European Parliament. And I wanted to share with them what I told you before, the multiple faces of Turkey, faces that perhaps in everyday life as we go on with our own jobs and have our own targets, we forget to look around. So maybe you need somebody to pick them and show them to us, because then we understand much better what's happening in a country neighboring to us, maybe with pe pe people with one or another religion, but the major issue is people ready to support others in need. And this exists a lot in Turkey. So this idea about the exhibition phases of Turkey is also how to transmit what I gained in these four or five years in the parliament to others, because it's precious. And the more we worked for this event and the more discussions we had, what we can do after this event with all the organizations or even with more organizations, it's something that we need to embrace it and make it bigger, because connections are the most important. Politicians will do their own job but also people have to do to play their part. But there is also another angle on this for this event. Nowadays, in the European Parliament, we are discussing the annual report about Turkey. And although we have differences, and during the time we had many clashes even about these reports, 
No country loves a report about the same country. It's not only Turkey that reacts the same way, it's Israel, it's every, every country. But this year, it's an element that I didn't expect it to be there. It's a proposal to terminate the accession process with Turkey. For me, this is something unacceptable. Because, OK, I can understand some right-wingers, or as the major problem of Europe is, right-wing parties embracing part of the rhetoric of the extreme right, because they don't want to lose, supposedly, voters. But when you embrace the beast, you become part of the beast. So I can understand some people taking sides. But we, as an institution, as a European Parliament, terminating the accession process, which, especially when there are problems in our countries that we relate, at that moment, we should put even more effort using that amazing tool, which is the accession process and all its roadmaps. Because the European way is not shutting the doors, saying that one country or another will never be able to do reforms, will never be able to follow on the way that we do business, we do education, we, do, uh, we support our citizens. It's not the European way. If it was that for Greece, we would never have the support we had on the economic crisis. OK, leave Greece to go away. They cannot work well. We heard that too. But the official stance was Europe is here to support. I, we want this also to be our stance with Turkey. There are problems, and there are issues, and there are things that we discuss between ourselves. There are, is many times heated discussions. I cannot hide the truth. But the solution is not less relation. The solution is more and more deeper, frank discussions. We don't hide anything from the public. We know the way because we have done it with other member states. They changed to become part of Europe. is a criteria of Copenhagen. So we do it for the Western Balkans. So we know the way. What we have to keep in mind is to keep the way open. So this moment that we are discussing this termination of the accession process, I hope it will not pass in the parliament. But then we also have the council, which I'm sure will never accept that throwing away this tool of cooperation, the only tool that we have in our disposal to be officially, institutionally uh, able to discuss with our Turkish counterparts and Turkish uh, society and Turkish ministers about what's not, in our opinion, going well. So I wanted also to show to my fellow parliamentarians that when they listen, they hear the word Turkey, and each of them has its own reaction. This is the reaction I would like them to have, to remember that when we cut the IPA funds, instrument of pre-accession funds, they're not some money that they don't go to the coffers of the government to spend as they see fit. They're money that they go directly to the citizens, directly to the NGOs, directly to the refugees. So when we do every action, some people are punished. No governments, not states, of course. People are punished. And I personally, but also I believe many of our parliamentarians will not accept that. So the question was, is it only this the face of Turkey? No. But this is the face I adore. This is the face I worked with. This is the face that it is dominant if you look at the hearts of the people. And this is the face that support those in need. And from the multi-faces of the world around, always I try to support the faces that are giving help to others. Ideologies, political stances, political you know, campaigns come and go. But what you do will be, when I was, will be gone from this institution, will be there. The Rushafaka is since 19th century. Other uh, NGOs which I met are newer, of course, but they, each and everyone produces 
uh, amazing results. We're discussing now with Lozev. Imagine not only the number of children suffering leukemia and getting a good result has grown from 20 to 92 percent, but also the stigma that society puts in these kids, parents not wanting kids to play with kids without hair. Can you imagine? the pain of a parent that has a child with leukemia and Lozev is trying to elevate, to, to, to make this problem uh, disappear. So many NGOs and we have also two teachers which are not NGOs, uh, Chevat and Dilek. And what have we learned from them? Money for the education are important. Better classrooms, better instruments, computers, less people per classroom. But what scientifically has been proved nowadays, and Mr. Grammatikakis is a famous professor in Athens and can give us his opinion, is the most, the single most important issue concerning the education of kids is the teacher. Not that the rest are not important and we have to work for the rest, but the most critical issue is the person, the personality, and the work that the teacher is doing. So we are very grateful also to them. I would like also to thank representatives, Ambassador Mehmet Kemal Bozai, permanent representative of Turkey to the European Union, and uh, I can say a good friend. Mr. Zeki Levent Gungruchu, Ambassador of Turkey in Belgium, and Mrs. Engin Solakoglu, first counselor at Embassy of Turkey in Belgium, and Disal Kirbashili Karagoglu, Consul General of Turkey in Brussels. I'm very happy that we have you today with us. We have met and exchanged opinions and make dialogues many times, but here in this evening where we all get to know the work of Turkish citizens, I think, and I'm very grateful, that you accepted the invitation to be part of this event. Now, Mr. Stylianidis must be on his way, so I will take two or three more minutes to, I don't know if my friend, Kader Sevinc, the EU representative, yes, for CHP in the EU, and also member of the Bureau of our Socialist Party is here. I am very grateful, Kader, for your presence, and she all, I'm also grateful to Kader because she showed me about democracy 0.40, 4.0, 4 which is an approach grassroots democracy. We have to reinvent uh, the political speech, we have to reinvent how we approach our institutions, and Kader's ideas uh, are very, very helpful on that issue. So what I told you in the beginning, that all these four and a half years we worked and worked with Turkish people. And it's not only me. Manolis Kefalogiannis is the chair of the JPC. He is somewhere there. And uh, we invited also Mr. Uh, Karayel and Sibel from the CHP to be part of this. They couldn't because you're passing the budget in Ankara. But they were very, uh, they were very happy to be here with us today. They ask, is it that simple? Are the relations, let's say, Greece and uh, e Turkey, are the, the, so, so simple to overlook? Don't we have such important issues that uh, maybe sometimes bring our countries, now I'm speaking like a Greek, in the, in the, in the brink of, uh, of a clash? And they say, no, it's not easy, but nothing in life is easy, only the populists find life easy and they offer the same solutions. If you vote for us, we will change everything in 15 days. If you vote again for us, then we will change your life. Going back 50 years ago, remember when our country was strong. There are no easy solutions. And anyone who promises that easy solution is lying. But we have seen that the more we work on common projects, the more we forget about the importance of other differences. We have, for example, the Lausanne Treaty that governs our relations. 100 years. Okay, let's make the next discussion about the Lausanne Treaty after 100 years. At the 200th 
years of the signing of this treaty. No need to solve every small question about that today. And also we have hydrocarbons lying on the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Let's see how we can use them as a tool to bring two communities together in an island that hasn't seen that solution 44 years ago. Tria. So the commissioner is coming in three minutes. I was saying using the hydrocarbons not as a tool of more clashes, but as a tool to find solutions that for the moment seem very difficult. My country, since 25 years ago, is fighting with former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia for the name. And of course, it is the base of our civilization. And of course, it's something we will never give, and they will never go back, and we will never go back. And suddenly, last year, there was an agreement. We found the common solution. It passed through a referendum from Northern Macedonia, as it will be named after the agreement passes from both countries. <laughs> suddenly, 25 years, we were exchanging insults. We were cutting economic ties. And suddenly, it happened. It took the will of certain politicians on both sides to overcome the problems. And with Turkey, we also had the big advantage of the modernization of the customs union. Why don't we do it? OK, there are problems in Turkey. Let's support Turkey to solve these problems, not to hide them under the carpet. The Copenhagen criteria, the cooperation, need specific rules, need justice on the economic scale, needs a lot of issues. But the result, which is out there, the result, the uh, modernization of the customs union means hundreds of thousands of jobs for both sides. And on this economic climate, this is the best we can work for. So there are uh, issues that we can gain. There are gifts that are waiting for us. And it takes a longer vision than this year's campaign or next year's elections. You have Turkey has municipal elections. Greece has four types of elections. Europe has the European elections. And Germany will have elections. Go out of the electoral cycle and do what? Do what the needs of the people are. Do what you are doing, how we can support you to do it even better and even better results. And then suddenly, we see that problems that seemed a mountain, now they're not such a big mountain, or they turn into solutions. What more can we want? So I'm not an optimist. By birth, I am a, the opposite. But through the work with the people, imagine this event three months ago, we were visiting Istanbul and uh, knocking on doors. They didn't know us, but we gained their trust. We gained all of your trust. And of course, we were amazed for what you were doing. So it was not an easy thing. It was not easy for you to trust us to bring you here. It was easy for us to create this exhibition here in the parliament where I also met parliamentarians coming by and telling, is this a show for Erdogan? And uh, we say, OK, Erdogan is the president of this country. But faces of Turkey, can't imagine one country having one face. The world is complex. Each country is complex. We go over prejudices, but the instruments to do that is you. By showing your work, by showing your existence, by pushing the message of this event after the event to all the parliamentarians and the assistants and to the press, then we do our job. And now I want to present you Commissioner Silanidis and a very good friend. Mr. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miltos. Dear representatives of Turkey Civil Society, dear colleagues and friends, it's really a pleasure to be here in the European Parliament. You know that the Parliament plays a key role both in EU-Turkey relations and the European Union's approach to refugees. I always rely on my dear colleagues of the European Parliament regarding my 
really in demanding obligation and duties as Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Management. I'm grateful uh, to my dear friend Milton Skirkos for this contribution to Parliament's work as Vice Chair of the delegation to the EU-Turkey Joint Parliamentary Committee and because he organized this important meeting today. The Turkish people are hosting the largest refugee population in the world. Some four million refugees are now living in Turkey. The European Union, Turkey, Turkish people, UN organizations, international NGOs, and local NGOs are working together to deliver, to deliver very strong results for the people who need our support. Vulnerable people who are fleeing war and persecution. And of course, maybe you know better than me, I just arrived from Turkey. <laughs> yes. Uh, that uh, 1.7 million children refugees in Turkey. It's a, it's a, it's a huge population. And uh, because, as I said, I'm just back from a mission to Ankara, and I saw with uh, my own eyes the big difference that EU humanitarian assistance under the EU facility for refugees in Turkey is making on the ground. Turkey's NGOs played a vital role in supporting refugees in Turkey to ensure that our assistance, the European Union humanitarian assistance, the assistance from European citizens, and this is very crucial and important, is reaching the most vulnerable. My dear friends, you bring expert knowledge. You understand the places where the refugees live and the different needs they have, because you know the crown better than all of us. And that is why we need to work with you and through our humanitarian partners in the United Nations and international NGOs. When we launch the facility for refugees, our humanitarian partners work with two local Turkish NGOs to deliver, to deliver the initial projects. Today, 60 local NGOs are helping the European Union and our humanitarian partners deliver humanitarian aid in Turkey under EU-Turkey facility. So it's a, a multiple different situation than two years ago. The increased role of local NGOs help us reach the most vulnerable refugees in Turkey, and you help us ensure refugees can access vital services like health and education, no matter which part of Turkey they live in and what difficulties they might face. Your efforts, dear friends, make a life-changing difference to refugees in Turkey and the European Union will continue to deliver on our promises in Turkey under the Facility for Refugees. We have committed 6 billion euros for these uh, uh, years, 2016 until 2020. Our programs are already having a huge impact on the ground. The emergency, maybe many of you, you know about this excellent program, ESSN, Emergency Social Safety Net, has supported 1.5 million vulnerable refugees. And I'm very proud of this because it is the largest humanitarian project in the, in the European Union's history, the largest humanitarian project funded by EU fund. And also, the, another excellent project, the conditional cash transfer for education program helps refugee families in Turkey ensure that their children go to school. By supporting over 410,000 children, the program has already surpassed its initial targets. And this is also very important. 
and we have to be proud, all of us, because it is a big achievement. And uh, through my visit, just uh, yesterday, I visited an accelerated learning center in Ankara, where UNICEF provides out-of-school refugee children with access to basic learning opportunities. These education measures are very important because we must prevent a long generation of refugee children and invest in the learning of out-of-school ch refugee children. This is our moral duty, our moral obligation. And it's very important, not only in Turkey, but everywhere, because it's the only way to create critical shield against radicalization, against forced recruitment, against forced labor, against forced marriage. Education emergencies, as I said many times, is my positive obsession. In our life, we need some positive obsessions. Uh, we remain my top priority. This year, we will increase the funding dedicated to education emergencies to 10% of our total humanitarian budget, and this is 10 times in the last three years. And the European Union in this critical field is leading by example. And under the second part of the EU-Turkey facility, we continue to support the most vulnerable refugees. And together with Turkish NGOs, Turkish people, and Turkish authorities, we also focus on transitioning our humanitarian funding to medium and long-term support. It's a very critical challenge. We have to be together in order to achieve another huge challenge and another big achievement. My dear friends, <coughs> again, a big thank to Miltos. And I'm very proud of what we have achieved so far, all together. And uh, as the European Commission for Humanitarian Aid, I look forward to continue this excellent work together because it's the only way for all of us. Unfortunately, alone we cannot achieve anything. But together we can achieve a lot, especially for the vulnerable people, and against these trends for radicalization and all these things which can destroy the future of the coexistence of the different religions and ethnic groups. Thank you so much again for your support. So thank you very much, Commissioner. A deep sight, insight in what is happening in the domain of refugees, and we all know that it is an issue that will not finish this year or the next now. I call on Ishil, my assistant, who is from Turkey also, and a key to my work uh, to uh, follow the rest of the discussion. I ask from the speakers, because the time is very limited, to keep to three, four minutes, and also I told them that I, um, I saluted the presence from the, uh, the officials tonight, so they should just concentrate without uh, calling to ambassadors because I did it for them and they have to concentrate to limit their speech because all of you cannot stay three and four minutes but we are very happy to have uh, from IKV, the President, thank you very much for being here. Isil, the floor is yours. Welcome all. Hoş geldiniz. Uh, we are very proud to host here today. Uh, 11 NGOs working in various fields and two uh, teachers, two primary school teachers um, with outstanding stories, all from Turkey, all coming from Turkey. And uh, now I would like to present to you the order they will take floor, they will take the floor. Uh, we will start with uh, Achev Mother Child Education Foundation, uh, then CHEDD Association for Supporting Contemporary Life. Darus Şafaka Society, Red Ribbon Istanbul, uh, Korunjuk Turkish Foundation for Children in Need of Protection, 
e, Losev Foundation for Children in Leukemia, e, Morçatı Purple Roof Women's Shelter Foundation, Social Band Foundation, Tegev Educational Volunteers Foundation of Turkey, e, Tohum Otizm Turkey Otizm Early Diagnosis and Education Foundation, Türgök Library for the Visually Impaired of Turkey, and then we will go on with our teachers, Cevat Ayna, and finally, last but not least, uh, Dilek Livaneli. Uh, I leave the floor to them. Thank you very much. Teşekkür ederim. Well, I'd like to welcome all the distinguished guests. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you to uh, Mr. Kirkos Miltiadis. Thank you for this invitation. I'm very grateful to be here. You have put a tremendous effort, I know, uh, in organizing this event. And Ushil also just would like to thank you quickly. Now, uh, at ACHEV, Mother Child Education Foundation, Early childhood education uh, is a priority area of our work. So what we're doing basically is strengthening the environment of the children in their, uh, of the young children uh, in their early ages. Now, uh, why early years? The first years, the early years of children are very critical in the sense that their brain development is really high and the social, emotional, cognitive, and physical developments are moving at a very high pace. So this is the reason investing in early childhood education is very critical. Now what we do as Achev, how do we approach this? The way we approach it is we uh, develop and implement evidence-based uh, education programs for parents, for mothers and fathers, for children, and also for women in terms of uh, literacy and empowerment. Uh, our programs are intervention programs. They're uh, minimum 14 week long with a group of uh, 16 to 18 uh, participants. <coughs> and uh, what we do is for the parents to enable them to provide them with the parenting skills they require so that they are more involved with their children, they are involved in their children's development. Now, uh, our programs, just very briefly, are mother support program, father support program, and program for children's for ages of five, and also program literacy and women empowerment programs uh, for women. And uh, also we do uh, research, uh, we do uh, campaigns, creating uh, awareness raising campaigns, and also advocacy work. One of the recent works we've done are with fathers. Uh, we did a nationwide research on the state of the fathers in Turkey, uh, and then uh, did a campaign on uh, to, to create involved fathers in Turkey. Okay, I just wanted to be sure that I'm on time. And uh, the uh, other important uh, issue is how we do this. Uh, what is the way uh, we implement our programs? Basically, uh, what we do is we uh, train program trainers who go out and implement the program. And during the implementation of the programs, we support the trainers, we supervise them, and we make sure that the uh, programs are implemented in a uh, high quality uh, way. And also, uh, another important program which we're implementing is with the children of age five uh, to prepare them for school readiness before they enter grade one. So this is a program we're implementing both for the Turkish children and also with the uh, Syrian refugee children in Turkey. And uh, it is uh, uh, basically uh, preparing the children for the uh, school. Now to conclude, uh, as I said, I'm very happy to be here. 
And also here today, uh, we are all together uh, as a group, as a dedicated group, I have to say, as uh, members of the civil society here. I would also like to congratulate all my colleagues for the remarkable work they are doing. I think we're putting a lot of effort all together to make the world a better place. Uh, and uh, we will continue to do that. And as a chair, we will continue to uh, invest in early childhood education in the future generations. I think this is very, very vital. And early uh, childhood development is picking up. It is vital for the, uh, for the foundation of the sustainable human development. It is a very critical period. And it is picking up, it is picking up. It was uh, also discussed in the G20 meeting. There's an initiative now. And also in Turkey, there's a lot of focus on the new vision document of the Ministry of Education. So we are very happy to be working all together for this. Thank you. Welcome all. Thank you for providing us this big opportunity. My organization is Association for the Support of Contemporary Living in Turkey. We are 30 years old, we have 110 branches, and we have more than 16,000 volunteers in Turkey. Currently, uh, we have touched the leaves of approximately 80,000 girls, and we would like to touch more and more. Since women are more disadvantaged to, uh, and more left out of the schools, we especially focus on the support of women education, but also we support boys' education too. As we choose our students with, among the economically disadvantaged students. Our students can dream of becoming teacher, doctor, artist, and more with the help of our beloved volunteers. Our primary focus is education for a modern Turkey in line with Atatürk's principles. We also work hard to contribute for a modern secular education system in different platforms as an education NGO. We support early education, primary and secondary school students. We provide school requirements and student basic needs. In our education centers, we help on families, we teach students, and also we increase awareness about child, children's rights, women's rights. Also, in order to develop potential of our students, we started the coding project, and for the future of Turkey too. Also, we mentor our university students in order to increase their potential and increase their self-awareness, self-confidence. Our greatest motivation is their smiling face, hopeful eyes, and their success. We have a lot of students who achieve their dreams and who are contributing modern society in their areas. I would like to share with you one of our stories. One of our girls have visited our organization for scholarship. She was graduated from a science high school and she got a high rank in university exam. But she was coming from a small village in east of Turkey. She was the second of six siblings. Her father had a serious disease which doesn't let him to uh, support his kids' education. Even though he was not sick, he couldn't afford six kids education. We provided her scholarship and also supported her for leadership, social, pro social leadership projects. She graduated from industrial engineering and started her career at one of the biggest German company, finished her master degree in a very reputable university. Currently, she is working as a manager in a software consultancy company and managing a team of 15. While she was sticking to life, she took responsibility of her brothers and sisters too. Now, 
They are working as computer engineer, mechanical engineer, medical doctor, junior officer, and biology teacher. By she, I mean me. Our organization gave a hand to me, and I gave my hand to my brothers and sisters. And now I am working in my organization as a board member, and I am trying to teach, touch more and more kids. I do my best, do my best to touch more, more life by supporting our organization, and I am working in different projects. I always keep in my mind that if we can help a kid, first he, she will improve herself, himself, and then their family, and then society, and then maybe the world. There is much more what we do for a modern Turkey. Please visit us and we can share, discuss, and get inspired by each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. Since uh, Mr. Kir Kirkos has asked us not to name uh, and thank anybody, but let me thank you as well. You deserve it. I have already expressed my great appreciation to you this, today, but also our ambassadors, Mehmet Kemal Gozai, who just arrived in Brussels, and our bilateral ambassador, Levent Gümrükçü, and all of you. Uh, I think we all belong to the same family. And uh, I'm going to talk about Darushafaka. Darushafaka we deem as a family, because it's one of the strongest edifices in the Turkish education system, in the sense that we have been established, we have been founded uh, almost more than a hundred, one and a half centuries ago, uh, and we are still continuing our, our good job. Ho hopefully we will continue that. I'm a board member, I'm a graduate of this family, I'm a Dar Shafaka graduate, but I just found two family members as well who introduced themselves. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy that uh, this meaningful event is also uh, uh, getting further meaning for us uh, because Dar Shafaka uh, is, I think, one of the leading institutions in the educational field by providing equal uh, educational opportunities to the disadvantaged students in the society who wouldn't be able to get this quality education if Dar Shafaka wasn't there. Uh, our um, source of, uh, social source of uh, students is, is the whole Turkey. Uh, they should uh, be either uh, coming from a family, single fa parent family, and also uh, they should be uh, low income uh, as well. Uh, uh, I was one of them, uh, and had it, had it not been for Dar Shafaka, I would have never been in the place that I am right now, and I'm very pleased that Dar Shafaka is touching uh, the lives uh, in a best way uh, to the uh, uh, young uh, generation of Turkey as well. Uh, it could be emulated in many parts. We are providing education to around 1,000 students, almost half of them girls, uh, our founding fathers from the inception uh, about in, uh, one and a half centuries ago wanted to include girls as well into this effort and we are proud that it's almost 50 years that we have also girls in this boarding school uh, which uh, uh, um, provide uh, the best of education that money can provide. Uh, we, we are an NGO because we, our sources are only donations. The simple five lira donation for a, from a child or a worker is as precious as any large donation for us because our roots is in the society and we will never forget this and we will always have this good relation uh, with the society as a whole. Uh, we are challenged uh, by the fact that a new era is dawning right now. Uh, we are at the thresholds of a new technological revolution, and uh, our uh, school is uh, bracing this challenge, and hopefully we will bring 
more uh, educational opportunities for the, uh, for the next century as well as uh, for the immediate uh, needs of the society. Uh, I hope Dar Shafaka will be a friend of the European Union. Thank you very much for including us to this invitation. And we believe that because we are a secular-minded uh, progressive institution, I believe that we believe that Europe is also our future and we are ready to walk uh, uh, down this path with the European Union. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite Arda Bey from Red Ribbon Istanbul. Hello everyone. Uh, I know everybody is a bit tired and nobody wants to listen to long uh, talk, so I will try to keep it really short. Uh, I will talk about HIV and Red Ribbon Istanbul. Uh, actually, it's not easy to uh, tell the story of HIV of a country like Turkey uh, because uh, th there are many problems, but also there are some good achievements. So I will talk about, first I will talk about achievements and then what we're doing in this context. Uh, yeah, it's not easy to tell you Turkey's HIV story in a couple of minutes. Uh, and then because just because of this, I will, uh, I will make a distinction as before and after diagnosis part. Uh, good example are from after diagnosis part, it will, uh, it will not be exaggerated statement to say, to say Turkey is one of the best practice in Europe with access to treatment, uh, treatment monitoring and viral suppression uh, when we consider the after, after the after diagnosis stage. So this claim is confirmed when we rem remember that still there are no basic treatment options are, or enough number of healthcare centers with, phys with physicians spe 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 specialized uh, HIV, uh, even in some uh, member countries. Uh, but it's not possible to say the same for before a uh, diagnosis stage. Uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, maybe we can talk about later, so I will be around. Uh, Turkey is still listed among the, among the low epidemic number countries, but considering the increasing rates in the recent years, it's the number of, it's the number one of the, number one in the region, even in, in also in Europe. Uh, this is bad news, but the good news about that, uh, the, the both civil society and physician groups are, we are able to uh, work together and we, we are really doing good on this point. Uh, I've been doing activism for for the last 10 years, uh, and HIV always been one of my prior interests and works area. And if I need to compare the current situation of the civil society uh, the, the 10 years before, even three years before, uh, I can frankly say that the solution providing and cooperation capacity has been seriously developed. So as a founder of uh, Red Ribbon Istanbul, I'm very happy that Red Ribbon Istanbul is one of the main actors of this change. Uh, I believe that basic function of an activist is to establish a fast, realistic, and uh, reasonable analytical re relationship with the problems instead of complaining. So this is really important. Uh, and uh, we keep on working with this approach at Red Ribbon Istanbul, and uh, so we believe we will contribute to finding the solutions. We are really believing that. Uh, and the last word, as an individual who believes and defends Turkey's Europe perspective and common values, I would like to thank Mr. Kirkos for providing such an opportunity to civil society as the main defense of defenders of European vision, and also uh, Mr. Ishil for her highest effort to holding this exhibition. And uh, I know we're not here for talk about politics, but I just want to make really short clear about it. Uh, I want to give a clear message to Two politicians who call for cancelling to accession, accession talks of my beloved country. So it's not that easy. Thank you. Ayşe Hanım from Korunjuk. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend uh, our deepest uh, gratitude to Mr. Kirkos and his team for having uh, this organization to take place and let us have uh, be a part of it. As Foundation uh, uh, ch for Children in Need of Protection, we are celebrating our 40th year uh, to serving uh, children who cannot take proper uh, parental care or no parental care at all. 
uh, trying to give them a loving and caring environment so they can uh, grow up, uh, get educated, uh, get access to good health, and uh, do sports, uh, everything, so they can uh, be a good uh, adult uh, when they grow up, uh, educated, self-sustainable uh, adults. Uh, every child is born with their rights, and it's us, the uh, adult, uh, adults, uh, to make sure they reach their uh, rights uh, properly, in full extent, and uh, with human dignity. Uh, so uh, we are focusing our uh, activities in three uh, areas. Uh, prevention, protection, and implementation. In the prevention side, uh, we're working with families to make uh, to make their awareness uh, on the risk areas uh, and to become better parents so they won't uh, let uh, conflict with their uh, children. And uh, we also teach uh, children about their rights and also we're working with uh, foster and biological parents uh, to uh, become better parents, uh, educating parents to become foster parents because it's important, we believe every child uh, has to grow with a family, but if they don't have that luck, uh, we go to the second area of our uh, project which is the uh, protection area. Uh, in the protection area, we have a children's village where we uh, give, uh, trying to give a loving f family environment for the children for about 20, 25 years uh, so they can get proper education and become uh, well adults. Uh, actually, we have a, a well adult here uh, with us who has grown up in our village and now he's going to school in uh, Holland. Maastricht University. And besides that, uh, we are also trying to uh, work with uh, families uh, about child abuse. It's a very important issue, in, in, like everywhere else in Turkey. And we're trying to uh, create awareness uh, with families and uh, colleagues uh, about detecting child abuse and the ways to prevent it. Uh, besides that, uh, we're working with uh, reunification processes with the children to uh, reunite with their uh, biological families or foster families so they can overcome the problems of uh, transition period. And on the third side, we're working with improvement uh, on that uh, when a child's state protection is lifted, uh, they have still they still have problems because they don't feel very confident so in that uh, stage what we're doing is we're trying to uh, give them consultation modeling and uh, rehabilitation uh, support if they need it and because of this devoted uh, services in 2005 we are granted uh, from uh, United uh, Nations Economic and so uh, Social Council, uh, a consultancy status. Uh, so, thank you very much for uh, being here and listening to us. Thank you. Sizin Hanım from LOSEV. Thank you very much and good evening. Uh, before starting, I would like to convey the best wishes of LOSEV Chairperson of the Board, Dr. Nazar, and Children with Leukemia also. As LOSEV Foundation for Children with Leukemia, we are honored to be a part of this meaningful and significant uh, organization today. I would like to start with some uh, worrying facts regarding cancer and leukemia. Cancer is a leading cause of death, not only in Turkey and Europe, but worldwide. And uh, only in Turkey, 6,000 children under 16 years old are diagnosed with leukemia and cancer each year. Uh, it can be said that the situation was much worse in 1990s before the foundation of LOSEV uh, because the survival rate was around 20% and 54 of 100 children were quitting treatment due to poverty. 87% of the families who are registered to LOSEV are from a low income background and 11% have no income at all. And LOSEV was established 20 years ago to improve the situation. 
We have started our journey with 15 children and right now we have more than 30,000 registered patients trapped to Turkey. All because of that, we are providing free of charge treatment in Losante Children's and Adult Hospital, accommodation in Losev Village, private school education in Losev School, as well as social, psychological, and financial support. Today, we are proud to say that as a result of our efforts and integrated approach, we managed to raise the treatment success rate up to 92% and have touched hundreds of thousands of people, including children with leukemia and cancer, as well as their parents. As we have underlined many times, we think there is no important thing than a life of a child. So as an organization having the special consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations since 2007, we do know that the fight against cancer and leukemia can only be won through individual, corporate, and organizational support. As non-governmental organizations, we must collaborate to keep children alive and provide them better lives. We, as an organization that is aiming for 100% treatment success, are building our future over this purpose, and we are hoping to receive the support of everyone, as well as the European Parliament. As LOSEV, we do believe that by sharing ideas, experiences, and information nationally and internationally, we can create a better, healthier, and a safer world. And lastly, we wish better days in which no children would die or suffer. Thank you very much. Leila Hanım from Morçatı. Evet onu fark ettim ama koridordan mı geliyor yoksa buradan mı geliyor? Uh, dear guests, uh, we are really happy to be here on behalf of Morçatı and thank you for hosting us. Uh, Morçatı is uh, pioneering an independent feminist organization that has been constantly active in the field of combating domestic violence and intimate partner violence against women. Uh, Morçatı was founded in 1990s in Istanbul by women who led the march against beating in 1987, a milestone in a feminist movement in Turkey. Morçatı has been specifically working to end domestic violence through feminist practice, improving the mechanism for combating violence, gender-based discrimination, and addressing false policies in the field of violence against women. Morçatı claims that violence against women is both the cause and a consequence of gender inequality, and it is also affiliated to the power imbalance between men and women. Therefore, Morçatı, the struggle of ending violence against women should be waged hand in hand with the fight against gender inequality and patriarchal system dynamics by enhancing women's solidarity and networking. Morçatı has been running a women's shelter and a solidarity center in order to provide counseling support for women and their children who have been su subjected to male violence. Since 1990, many women and children subjected to violence have received social, psychological, legal support from the Solidarity Center. Besides the Solidarity Center, since 2009, a shelter supported by the municipality of Shishli is in operation with a capacity of 20 women and children. Morçatı aims at keeping the sustainability of this shelter as a model for women's shelter that in terms of demonstrating the effectiveness of a feminist operation methodology in empowerment women and children. Apart from the Solidarity Center and the shelter, Morçatı is playing an active role on women's rights advocacy in Turkey. Uh, especially in recent years, um, government policies prioritize the preservation of the unity of the family rather than the woman's need and empowerment as an individual. So this has been created a direct effect in the area of prevention of violence against women. Especially in last years, women in Turkey face many threats and attacks on women's rights, which could be considered as backlashes. Currently, the law number 6284 and the right of alimony are under attack in Turkey. The law to protect family and prevent violence against women offers the most robust solution as preventive measure to violence against women and came into effect following long years of struggle by feminists. This year, women were out proclaiming this law is a life saver for women. As the Morchat Women's Shelter Foundation, we have started a campaign called I Made a Decision in order to emphasize the vital role 
vital importance of this law for women to increase the awareness of women under the law. Lastly, the solution of the injustice caused by gender inequality will be achieved through the establishment of gender equality, not by taking back the rights gained by the struggle of women for many years. So we are not giving up to struggle against violence against women and demanding our rights. Thank you for listening us. Please, our friends on the back, please lower your voices a bit because we can listen better our respected speakers. Ece Hanım from Social Bank. Hello all. Thank you for coming here. And uh, before I start, thank you for the silence. So uh, first of all, I would like to um, thank Mr. Kaikos for inviting us here. It's a great honor for us to represent our country and represent our NGO in international areas. And dear ambassadors, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ece Çiftçi, and I am the founder and chairwoman of the Social Bank Foundation. And my journey started when I was 14 years old in high school and rea I realized that every children don't have enough opportunities to be aware about and discover their talents. So um, I started to work on my project and right now it became a Social Bank Foundation and we are working with a huge group. And I would like to tell you more about what we are doing, why we are doing and how we are doing in a two, se in a two minutes. So uh, in, with Social Bank Foundation, we are working with primary school students and our aim is to improve and discover their talents because we know that with the personal awareness and with the quality education, students need to be aware about their talents and aware about their social selves. So we have 10 main workshops and 36 hour curriculum which is based on talent education. We have music workshop, we have art workshop, we have short film invention and sport workshop. With these 10 main workshops, we started to improve students' talent and we started to match them with the supporters today so they can continue to um, develop their talents, let me say. On the other hand, we are working with 350 volunteers in the field and all of them are university students because we want to increase the volunteer rate in Turkey. That's why we are working with the university students. Today, Social Bank Foundations work with 65 different regions in Turkey and six main branches. But as a Turkish NGO, our one of the main value is became a world citizen. That's why since five years we are working 12 different countries all around the world, such as Mongolia, such as Cambodia, such as Nepal, such as Jordan. We realize that um, developing countries have the same problems about reaching the quality education. That's why we put our one of the values becoming a world citizens. As an international um, Turkish NGO, one of the most important thing is financial sustainability. I think it's common for all of us in here. So that's why we created our social entrepreneurship model. We have two sub-brands called Social Bank Store and Social Bank Academy. These two sub-brands fund the Social Bank Foundation. So with this model, let me say, we had a chance to two years ago represent Turkey in G20 summit. Last year, we had a chance to had a, um, take an award from US State Department and we are the first NGN, first representative who won this award about emerging young leaders. So also with this social entrepreneurship model, we had a chance to talk to more about international area. We had a chance to give a speech in NYU, Sorbonne, Northeastern Universities, and in February, we will be in MIT to talk about how this sustainability works in our NGO. So lastly, we believe that civil society and NGOs will make this world a better place to live in. Thank you. Thank you. So as advised, I will skip the greetings, Mr. Kirkos. 
Okay, this is Said Tosyalı, General Manager for uh, TEGEV, Turkish Educational Volunteers Foundation. Briefly said, uh, uh, TEGV, sometimes it's being confused. Uh, our foundation is uh, established in 1995 with the main objective to deliver quality education to children in need. Actually, uh, our foundation uh, was set up by a group of business people and uh, academicians uh, 24 years ago who believe that education happens to be one of the major issues of the country, which unfortunately is still a major concern. With 17 million students in the school system and uh, in a geography as large as several states of the European Union, uh, one probably can imagine the magnitude of uh, school system uh, we are dealing with in, in Turkey. As TEGEV, our target group is uh, students aged uh, 6 to 14, and uh, our services are open to all uh, without any discrimination or preselection. As the Mr. Commissioner already mentioned, uh, uh, when I visit uh, some of our uh, facilities around the country, every now and then I run into uh, children of refugees. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have no uh, pre-selection at all. Since the foundation in 1995, uh, nearly 3 million uh, students have benefited from our services and each year in our 73 locations, which you can see on our map, uh, each year we have about 150 students coming and uh, using our facilities. And I must emphasize that all the service is free of charge and all are sponsored by uh, corporate or individual donations. Our unique model consists of locations, programs and volunteers. We operate 10 educational parks, 39 uh, learning units which are the uh, fixed locations and then 24 mobile uh, units uh, or trailers, which we call fireflies. Our facilities are child-friendly, they are colorful, and they are very functional and attractive, where the children come with fun, and they learn as they play, and then uh, they have joyful time. Regarding our programs, uh, TEGEV delivers supportive courses. I must uh, emphasize that we are not a school, we are not an alternative to the school, but we are only supporting the Ministry of Education system on an uh, official protocol which is already made for the next three years to come. So we provide courses in math, science, reading, arts, and informatics. Like informatics, for example, since it's set up in September 2017, already 100,000 children and 5,000 volunteers have met with coding which is to say they have, they are, they have met with this uh, coding activity uh, to overcome their digital literacy issues. Apart from these, there are short-term activities, namely uh, English language, for example, uh, hygiene, or uh, universal uh, skills such as ecology, all aimed to support the children's self-development. Last but not the least, our volunteers constitute the backbone of our system. We have about 8,000 volunteers each year, which deliver uh, these courses to our children. They, they go through a very uh, detailed uh, screening process and selection process, and they get a certain training before they start meeting with the, with the children. So I'd like to close by thanking Mr. Kurgos uh, for putting this wonderful event together and also uh, special thanks to attorney Mrs. Uh, Ishil Ergeç. I know who, uh, she has worked a lot to put this event uh, in life. Uh, so please do visit our booth uh, in, in case you want to learn more about TEGEV and our activities. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening. On behalf of Tolum Autism Foundation, I would first like to express how we are grateful to uh, you uh, for the European Parliament for hosting us here. I stand here today both as a founder of an NGO that works in the field of autism and as a mother of a young man with autism. 
20 years ago, it had not been possible for my son, Jim, to be properly diagnosed with autism in Turkey. The despair and loneliness I felt during those days instilled in me the idea of leading the way through this dark path for mothers in the same situation and all of our autistic kids. Families of people with autism have no choice but to be the parent, the advocate, and the voice of their autistic kids. Some of the frequent problems these families were, are forced to overcome are negative treatment of parents and siblings in public, and them having to fight against misinformed perceptions, the reluctance of the fathers of children with special needs to face and accept the situation, strikingly high divorce rates, and the lack of knowledge, experience, resources, and sensitivity of the government officials regarding this subject. We embarked on this journey with 23 esteemed co-founders and established our foundation as a health and education focused nonprofit organization that works towards the early diagnosis of children with autism, their socialization through special education programs, and the distribution of this know-how to all over the country. In order to explain the scope of our activities, I would like to go briefly of some of the things we have done during the last 15 years. We have founded a model school. Since then, 1,900 children are attending this school, and 918 of the students are supported with scholarship, scholarships. We carried out 20, 33 national and international projects. We screened 55,000 people with autism. We trained 12,000 teachers and uh, 2,000 healthcare personnel. We delivered more than 150,000 learning kits and books to families. We founded a continuing education unit and trained more than 15,000 people. We donated educational materials to 36 public schools where children with autism are enrolled in. We provided free counseling and evaluation to more than 9,000 people. All in all, we managed to make a difference in the lives of 282,000 children with autism and their families in the past 15 years. Looking back, it, it could be said that our efforts have paid off and much has changed for the better in the field of autism. However, the amount of things to do and change is still homogeneous. The prevalence of autism is increasing and it is now one in 68. I will shortly touch upon the dramatic results of autism knowledge and perception of individuals in Turkey survey, which we conducted in 2015 and 17. The first research showed that the rate of participants who have heard of autism was a mere 29%. But by the second attempt, it, is, it has increased to only 58%. However, 82% of those who knew autism answered that they did not know the symptoms of autism. The lack of public knowledge beyond name recognition shows that the road ahead is long and there is still so much work to be done. With our unyielding mindset and conviction, we will keep working to raise awareness of autism and continue to dream of a hopeful future for individuals with autism and their families. We would like to thank to all our supporters, collaborators who have been with us on our journey, and of course, our audience here today. Thank you very much. Shafakan. Finally, the Braille book was in my hands. I couldn't believe it. I hold it a while. I even smelled it. I was so much feeling the lack of reading books that I don't remember how I read the first half. Ladies and gentlemen, the passage I read is a part of a letter uh, from a very young member of the Library for Visually Impaired of Turkey, shortly Turgök. Turkuk was established in 2004 in Izmir as a non-governmental organization by Gültekin Yazgan, who was a teacher, a lawyer, a writer, and an unforgettable leader for visually impaired people in Turkey. 
He began dreaming of a library for the blind people in Turkey in 1943, when he was first started borrowing braille printed books from the Royal National Library for the Blind in United Kingdom. After 60 years, he made his dream real at the age of 75 and founded the library Turgök. The main objective of Turgök is to increase the cultural and educational level of blind people in Turkey. To reach this objective, we try to provide a basic solution to the blind for their lack of access to the printed materials. In the direction of this aim, Turgo produces and sends audio and braille printed books to its members, the number of which is over 6,000 from all ages. We specially spend more effort for children's and students' needs. The library has a wide range of books, literary, has self-help, children books, textbooks, cookbooks, reference books, and books for learning English. Three magazines, one audio and two braille, are prepared and sent to the members every month. Besides the books we prepare for their special needs, which they don't have to return, the members of Turgök can borrow braille printed books whenever they want it. The main aim of the braille bar book borrowing service is to enable the members, especially students, to take pleasure in reading. In addition to the productions, we plan some activities for improving the quality and happiness of blind people's lives. For instance, we organize courses for braille reading and writing, computer using, mathematics, braille musical notes. We sometimes organize workshops such as cooking, handcrafts, rules of good manners. And the story writing competition is held every year among both teenagers and adult blind members of the library. All the productions and services are done by about 300 volunteers led by a limited number of staff and financed by donations and sponsors. Now let's go over shortly what we are looking for. We want to reach more blind people to serve. Second, we want to increase the number of braille and audio books in our library. We want to keep being up to date on technical improvements in our field. And since all of our services are free of charge, of course, we need more sponsors and benefactors. I want to finish my words again with a passage from a letter of Turgök member. Please really believe that none of your efforts and even none of your seconds you spent for us is useless. They return us as knowledge. I want to thank for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to introduce our library. And also I want to thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Cevat Bey, buyurun. I'm very pleased and honored uh, to be here with you. I would like to tell you about the beginning of Happy Learning Class and Cat Family in a Butuk village school with many beautiful trees in the backyard. Everything started with Im imagination and uh, me and my students have imagined a very different classroom environment. We wondered, we researched, we cooperated. As a result of our research, we designed a learning environment that could meet our needs. Our most important goal was uh, to have a learning environment where can we enjoy learning together and become a learning partner. The physical environment was ready and it was time to organize the teaching programs. As a class using cooperative learning and problem-based learning methods actively, it was just we, what we wanted. As I'll, to, as I'll told you, our school is a nature as a result of this, my students were bringing something from backyard, even animals. While waiting 
for what they were going to bring to class this time. My students came to class with a box and there was a cat inside it. They asked whether they could take care of it in the class or not. I informed them uh, about the difficulties of carrying the cat in the class atmosphere and I told them they might have some problems. They detected about 60 problem cases. They worked, to, they worked on the problem cases for two weeks. After coming up with solutions for the problems they have identified, we voted in the class council. Let the cat live with us or not. I voted yes as well, and our lovely adventure started. The most important thing was that my students organized the process and they carried out everything by themselves. A story which is amazing, joyful, and full of happy learning activities. Our crucial outcomes are social and emotional development, creating a life atmosphere with a cat, love for animals, real life problems and learning, collaboration and problem solving, uh, self-management and class assembly, democracy, task assignments, responsibility and participati participating social responsibility projects actively, budget management, animal rights, pregnancy and pregnancy process, empathy, respect and happiness. Information in our informations in course books are not related to students' potential, but authorities insist on this education system. Let's create a learning environment that supports students' imagination and creatively unlimitedly. So they get the joy of learning. They turn the hope for the future. They beautify the future. Thank you. And finally, our teacher, Dilek Livaneli. Thank you. Ah, so excited. <laughs> I want to say hi uh, by starting with love, respect, and a huge smile. Today, I want to share the reason of my smile about my passion for my occupation, and uh, my ambition for my career. <laughs> the power I have gained uh, being for a teacher. And my devotion to my career and why I feel devoted to my job. And it feels great to be here. And really it feels great to meet you all. Such wonderful, wonderful people uh, in a wonderful occasion. Thank you, Mr. Kyriakos. Thank you. Thank you so much from my heart. <laughs> there are about one million teachers in Turkey, and I am just one of them. I am a primary school teacher, and I have a multi-grade multi -grade classroom. I have worked in villages for 16 years. Just imagine, just imagine, you are appointed a village school, you are alone, and you are a woman, what can you do? What can you do? What does being alone mean? You are a headmistress, the teacher, the officer, the secretary, the cleaner, all of them, even the cleaner when necessary. Sometimes, sometimes you see there is an absence of something and you'd like to fill the gaps or rebuild everything. Most of the time, that's not easy. You need to provide energy, vision, courage, effective communication and inspiration. If you can do this, if you can do this, one day, people believe in you, trust in you, love you and follow you. I have always wanted to be a good teacher. What is a good teacher like? I have been looking for the answer of this question since the day I started teaching. After a while, I realized there is no specific answer to the, this question. And every day I find new answers. What is a good teacher like? What is a good teacher like? Good women being a friend, a philosopher, guide mentor, creative, counselor, role model, inspiration, more and more. 
And you have to take care of not only students, but also their families. I think inspiration is a very important word when you talk about teaching and leadership. I have been inspired by my head teacher, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, he is here. He is here. I have always wanted to be a good teacher. And one day, I was chosen one of the best teachers in the world by Worky James Foundation. Wow, I think I'm becoming a good teacher now. Teachers are the one and the only people who save nations. Bir milleti yalnız ve ancak öğretmenler kurtaracaktır. I want to thank everyone who is here, who is doing something good, who makes the world better, who is a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dear friends, we have reached the end of the presentations. I know it was a long process. Now, I would like to ask the NGOs to take the tablets from here because we will move for a relaxed session to Salon 3 where we have a small cocktail and we will have the chance of absorbing this information and getting more and more. So my assistants will lead you to the Salon 3, Ishil, Katerina, Beatrice, the Greek assistants and my Turkish assistants. But please, the NGOs must get the tablets because you never know, we never turn our backs. And thank you very much for your patience and for the, your participation in this important for us and I hope for you event. Thank you very much.